Board Oral History Project. We're talking with Gary Hansen. It's uh, March, what did I say it was, the 19th? 18th, March 18th, uh, 2009. Uh, Gary, we left uh, the last tape talking about sovereignty, and I think we, I think we got that, but there's an interesting um, follow-up to that having to do with marketing water. The Indian tribes here have, as we've discussed, an entitlement to a great deal of water. Cities uh, are ha have shown us, especially now because California and Arizona and Nevada are in the throes of a multi-year drought and we don't know how long it's going to last. Uh, you mentioned Palo Verde Irrigation District and we know, for example, the Metropolitan Water District is paying farmers in the Palo Verde Irrigation District the fallow land. And in effect, they're buying the water. Uh, the price is variable, but it's in the range of $300 an acre foot or so. Um, Southern California, especially with its large population, uh, is always and probably will always be looking for water. But it, it occurs to me that there is uh, an admonition that prevents the, uh, the tribe from selling water off the reservation. The interesting linkage to uh, sovereignty is that if it's a sovereign nation, why can't they do whatever the heck they want to do with the water? Uh, so I, I may be a little off base there, but uh, could you uh, could you address that? Uh, could the Indians market their water off the reservation? And if they could, would they be interested in doing so? Well, I believe they, they can market their water off reservation, but whether they are going to be allowed to by the powers that be is a whole other story. Um, the federal, federal law does not give the tribes the ability to market their water. We have the ability to market our water. As a sovereign nation, we have control of our resources. And that was, if you look at the evolutionary history of water law related to Indian reservations. It goes back to the Winters Doctrine in the early 1900s, which um, basically said that the reservations were given water at their inception as part of the whole package deal of g being given a homeland that the tribes could live on in perpetuity and, and have enough resources there to support them for as long as they care to live there and also the right to use their resources as they see fit for the development of the, re of the reservation and the benefit of the people on the reservation, of the, of the Indians, uh, the tribal members. So federal government doesn't give us the right to market our water. We have that right to start with. Uh, what is under control of the federal government and also the uh, non-Indian water users, is the ability to move our water around. And that is really, I believe, the main sticking point that we have. Because, uh, as I mentioned, the politics of uh, the federal government and the administration that's in power at a particular time in the federal government really go a long way to dictating what the tribes can do. If the administration is uh, desirous in helping the tribes, I believe we could easily market our water, move it around, do whatever we would choose to do with it. But I think that the, um, the realities of the political situation are that, uh, th that we have been uh, foreclosed out of that option on a number of, uh, a number of times. Uh, we. Uh, let, let me back up, though, and say that the tribe's desire to market their water has, is certainly not a uh, slam-dunk deal, whether we would, would even want to market it. The, um, there is a great deal of resistance amongst the tribal members to marketing their water, and this resistance stems from a fear of loss, of losing it. Uh, if, 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 they, if they give it away, they won't be able to get it back. That's, that's the, that is a, a very real fear amongst many tribal members. So actually even thinking about uh, leasing our water, 
uh, is is an internal battle of, of great uh, magnitude. So, uh, I mean, personally, I think that we can do it. We have the we have the the legal right to do it based on our sovereignty, but the um, but the mechanisms to do it are controlled by others in most cases, and they have, might have a, a, a personal interest to to hinder our, um, our ability to do it. Um, so, you know, the long term picture that I see with with water marketing is, um, I think that if we could do it in such a way that it would not threaten the long-term viability of the tribe's water right, we'd do it. If we could do it on, under a short time frame, a certain amount of water, a set amount of water, under, under a short time schedule, uh, provided to a user who wouldn't become dependent on that for in perpetuity, like a city, for example, um, we would do it. If we could contribute to a water bank, for example, if we could contribute a set amount of water into a water bank that would be sort of like a deposit into the bank that wouldn't uh, would be a one-time deal, would put, put, would put a deposit in the bank, it wouldn't be tied to a long-term obligation for us to provide that water in perpetuity, I think we'd do it. So you, so the uh, tribes do not participate in the Arizona groundwater banking program? No, we don't. You would if you could? or Well, under under the proper circumstances, we, w we would certainly consider it. Yeah, okay. Um, well, let's talk about what's being done with the water then here on tribal land. Uh, sure. What, uh, Actually, that's our first priority. Our first priority for use of our water is for development of the reservation. Uh, really, our my mission in being here is to, first of all, uh, provide the greatest possible benefit to the tribal members. And secondly, to provide that benefit by using the water in the most efficient ways possible. So that's it. Um, and then that, <clears throat> first of all, means irrigation of the irrigable lands on the reservation. The tribe is uh, really uh, blessed. If you look in the world, there are very few places in the world that have a, uh, a combination of natural benefits that, that we have here. We have um, excellent source of water that comes to us by gravity, so we don't have to pump it. Um, we have year-round sunshine. We have probably the, one of, the, I mean, if not the highest days of sunshine. I mean, we probably do have the highest days of sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly have, at Parker certainly, has the record for the highest temperature in Arizona. Actually, Lake Havasu City tries to claim that, but I know for a fact that Parker does hold the record. And, and the record is? 128 degrees. So they claim 129, but I say, ha, <laughs> prove it. <laughs> it's a, that was a fluke. They had their thermometer in a parking lot. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, um, we have abundant resources here. Uh, so we can grow great crops. We do have a couple of drawbacks, though. Um, one of the drawbacks is uh, the transportation of our crops. Um, and this relates to the uh, ability of the tribes to maintain the roads. We do have uh, a drawback because uh, many of the roads that go out to the tribal fields are dirt roads that are in less than optimal condition. So that really hinders our ability to transport crops. Uh, it increases the cost of uh, moving crops because 18-wheelers uh, don't want to drive on our rough roads to go in to haul out the hay, for example. So we have, we have that drawback. Uh, we also have a drawback because we are a little bit too far away from the U.S.-Mexico border to have a really reliable uh, labor source. Uh, Imperial Valley has a much more, um, a much more, a much easier time getting labor to to raise high value crops than we do. We are about two and a half hours drive from the border, and so a round trip, a daily round trip of five hours, is pretty much. A, a real tough sell 
to get laborers to come up to raise high value crops. Um, but it's not for uh, Imperial Valley. That's, that I, that's one, of, one of their big advantages. Um, also, there's a slight temperature difference between Imperial Valley and here. So those few degrees mean that crops in Imperial Valley can get to the market first. And that tends to uh, tip the scales a little bit to those guys. Because they're warmer longer and the warm, crops, bit crops yeah. mature right. more quickly Just in all season. All they need is a couple of days. Yeah. In, the, in, the, in the cutthroat vegetable market, you know, all they need is a couple of days between the, the best price and the, and the bottom. So, well, what kind of crops are grown here on Indian land? Um, historically, we have grown alfalfa, cotton, and wheat. And, and for many, many years, alf uh, cotton was king and alfalfa was second. And then wheat was planted sort of in between. This, this mix has changed lately because of the changes in the markets. Um, cotton has become much less of a, of a high value crop. There is a lot of competition coming from China and Brazil and other countries, uh, which have has decreased the value of cotton on the reservation. This last year, uh, well, 2008, was the first year ever that we planted more wheat than cotton. Now that, of course, has a lot to do with the fact that a bushel of wheat was selling for two and three times what it normally sells for in 2008. And as a result, there were many, uh, many farmers who jumped on that and, and got contracts to grow wheat because you can grow wheat here in Parker almost year round. Uh, but they uh, they jumped on it and planted many, many acres of wheat to take advantage of that uh, high value crop rate. Uh, the, the the crop that's really coming on strong, in addition to wheat, uh, and our majority crop is alfalfa, and the reason that alfalfa is really um, coming on strong, I mean, for, for a starter, Parker has historically been a very high quality uh, growing area for alfalfa, produces a very high quality crop. Um, and that, that use for alfalfa is mainly for dairy cattle feed. So we, we, we supply our, our crop, we, we, we grow alfalfa for the dairy industry. But we grow a very high quality of alfalfa, which gets a high dollar. Price. And you're getting multiple cuttings a year. Yes, we can get uh, safely nine or ten cuttings, and sometimes more. Wow. Um, and there, are, there is also a, a lot of research going on these days to make alfalfa even more productive and uh, subsequently increasing the consumptive use of the crop to, uh, to actually in some cases almost double what, is, what it has historically been. So alfalfa is really a big crop. Um, also, sort of feeding into that is sort of a phenomenon that's happening with the dairies because a lot of dairies are being sort of uh, elbowed out of the metropolitan areas in Southern California and in Phoenix area. And as a result, they're moving out toward Parker. So we're having these massive large dairies come out and be located close to us, relatively close to us. So transportation costs have dropped way down, and we've become a much more attractive source of alfalfa for these big dairy operations that have moved out of the metropolitan areas. So that, that is a combination of factors that has really helped us. Now there are some specialty crops that we can grow that are really good dollar producers, and one of the big ones is onions. Now onions, uh, the, the, the reason that onions have become such a big crop is because of the popularity of salsa as a condiment and uh, used by McDonald's and every other fast food restaurant. They all sell salsa. They all provide salsa with their with their food, and um, and plus it's it's just been skyrocketing in popularity. So to feed, to make salsa, you need onions, and uh, that's why we our onion growing has really shot up because we can grow good onions here. Uh, most any time. 
what's what is your vision then of the future of the tribal lands here? I, uh, that's a tough question, I guess. I mean, you, you've got a, a prescribed number of acres, you've got a prescribed amount of water, uh, you have the difficulties involved in water marketing. Uh, you see the tribe tribal lands just continuing as they are today? Or? Yes, I do. I, I think that. I think the tribe will continue on pretty much as they have been historically. I, I believe that we will have a um, sort of a, uh, I, I think we will develop our <coughs> lands along the river in, in areas where we can have uh, residential areas and resort areas, uh, you know, maybe pr protect some of the areas as, as wildlife habitat. And, and that's another thing. I. I wanted to mention, um, we have been very instrumental in protecting the shoreline along the Colorado River for environmental, uh, basically wildlife habitat purposes. Uh, the tribe set aside uh, about 1,200 acres in the Ahakab Preserve, which is a, a, a basically a nature preserve to, to turn back the clock to the way it was before uh, development was taking place along the river. And that's what the Ahaka Preserve is, is doing. Can you, can you spell that for us? For uh, a H, it's two words, uh, A H A, Aha, and Kav, K H A V. Uh, and that's a, a nature preserve on the reservation. Okay, thank you. Um, and they, they're doing a lot of work in uh, uh, the removing of salt cedar, for example planting of cottonwoods and willows, uh, having areas dredged out, backwater areas, backwaters of the river dredged out to provide, you know, beautiful habitat for, uh, for fish and waterfowl. How much of the river are we talking about? Five miles, ten miles? Uh... Well, it's 1,200 acres and it's, 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 a, it's a ribbon that, that goes along the, the uh, riparian shoreline of the river. Um, the total length of the preserve, I would, I would hazard a guess, of maybe three miles. Okay, and that's but just on the Arizona side. Just right? on the Arizona side, but but really, when you look down the whole of the river, um, the 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 shoreline on the Arizona side of the Colorado River on the reservation is almost undeveloped at all. I mean, there are areas where they have there have been uh, flood control structures built and uh, some levees, uh, water control structures built by the Bureau of Reclamation to prevent erosion of the shoreline. But basically, it's a long ribbon of natural riparian habitat all the way down through the reservation. On the California side, we have uh, quite a number of um, mobile home, well, they're, they're, they're mobile home parks, but they're more, they're more like a resort to development where people, uh, people have houses and nice, nice homes along the river. That's on the California side. But on the Arizona side, it's pretty well undeveloped. And the tribe has a very strong interest in protecting their, uh, their natural habitat. And they, they'll, they'll just bend over backwards to uh, do a good job of it. So that, that is something that, uh, that is a long-term benefit. We, we've sort of, you know, jokingly thought we could, we could put a second river down through the reservation. We could make a meandering backwater stream that went through the whole reservation and I mean, we have enough land, we could do it. We could sort of have a double river system down through the reservation. But that would be fantastic. That would be the, the probably the number one tourist attraction in the area. You mean it would take water out of the river upstream and then just put it back downstream at the end of the ribbon, which yeah. is basically what, what McCulloch did with his London Bridge. I mean, yeah. he made a, it's a real short river, but he... Well, we could do that, but it would all be through natural habitat because there's a lot of existing meanders and there's a lot of just natural features that would allow that to happen. Yeah. We've thought about different things like that and, and different things like down in the southern end of the reservation where there are some, uh, some large tracts of uh, native mesquite that there hasn't been any development to turn that into uh, first-class wildlife habitat and put water in the area that would draw the wildlife in there, make it a beautiful place. Yeah. So. I should have asked earlier, what's the population of the tribes? Uh, here, there are, within there are, the critter. On the reservation, on the reservation, there are about three thousand tribal members, and there are about out of a total population about ten thousand in the area. In the area, 
and that, that doesn't include the uh, Parker Strip area and upriver. It was pretty, pretty dense population up that way, but that's just uh, in the reservation area and Parker area. Yeah. All right. Well, I think I'm kind of out of questions. Uh, we've covered a great deal of the waterfront, no pun intended. A great deal of the waterfront here. Anything I've forgotten? Anything that you'd like to mention with respect to? Uh, well, not, not really. I think we've uh, done a pretty good job of covering most, most everything that uh, that's going on. So, okay, uh, excellent. Actually appreciate the opportunity to do this. Well, we uh, uh, we thank you for your time. And it's good for uh, me as well as it is for people watching this. Yeah. So. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Gary. Okay.